everybody. We're back with part two. Uh, we're talking with Andy Thomas, who, if you don't know who he is, um, just be sure to see part one first. And uh, if you don't want to go back to that, Andy is the director of the Glastonbury Symposium. Mm, still called that, right, Andy? It certainly is. And uh, one of our great researchers in the crop circle phenomenon, author of several books. He, his book was the first crop circle book I ever read. And uh, his new book is called Truth Agenda. We're going to be talking about the book and carrying on on some of the subjects we discussed in part one. Hello again, Andy. Hello. It's nice to be back. Actually, Truth Agenda is quite an old book now. Uh, my latest book is Conspiracies, in fact. Uh, the updated version, the, the expanded and updated version, which you'll find easily on Amazon wherever you are in the world. Okay. So have a look out for that. So yeah, Conspiracies. The, the facts, the theories, the evidence. So oh that's, that's actually my newest book. Oh, yes. I'll have but to grab truth, that. Truth Agenda is also worth reading. I highly recommend it, but I'm slightly biased. Truth Agenda is a wonderful book. Thank you for creating that. And uh, so, let, okay, so let's talk about what you're saying is the new book is kind of an expansion of, of Truth Agenda. So, you know, people, because you're looking for information, get them both and do yourself a favor. So I have not read the new book. So where do you want to start? What do you want to, where do we want to start with the, the nut of Truth Agenda and how that has, has been, uh, let's say, brought forward and verified some of the things that are in, in that book? What is it, three years old now or more? No, so the Truth Agenda, the original version of it, and there's been several versions and updates of it, the original one, believe it or not, it was 11 years ago. Get out. Um, but it, it's a book that's been very important uh, because I think a lot of people struggle in this kind of truth-seeking world to really get to the nub of what the arguments are. And I think really, right, that's what I'm always trying to do. There's a lot of confusion outside of our realms, and we can talk about things. We know the reference points. But outside of that, a lot of people are coming new to it, and they don't really know where to begin. It can seem overwhelming. So what I've always tried to do with both the Truth Agenda in all its versions and the Conspiracies book in both that, uh, the versions of that, it is to try to show people what the arguments are, what the evidence for those arguments is, and why we should care and make it accessible because there's a lot of stuff out there that seems overwhelmingly dark or it's just too much information or you get you know some researchers they shake their fist at the you must believe me and, and it, it puts people off actually so i try as much as possible to just step back a bit from that and say look look let's look at the evidence here are the facts of why people believe this or this and look at it yourself and see you know what's going on and you will come to your own conclusions people are very good at understanding the truth once they smell it uh, and i think you know it's it's all too easy to assume that people actually haven't got any faculties people when you give them reasonable evidence they can sort things out for themselves very often it's just breaking them out of you know that control as you would call it matrix i mean the show is beyond the matrix well if you take the matrix as the film the movie the matrix it's about people trapped in a world they don't even know they're trapped in it until they come outside of it exactly. and you're all about going beyond the matrix so that's a fantastic you know name to have for the show uh, and your book because it we that's what i'm trying to do that's what you're trying to do we're trying to say just step back from everything you think you know. And it's not that big a difficult thing to do. It's easier than you know. And you suddenly see the shape of what's going on around. And all you need to do is to give people enough examples and make it accessible and not shout too much at them and don't tell them to believe anything. Just say, I offer you this as a possibility. See what you think. And people are quite sensible. Uh, and, you know, I give a lot of talks often to mainstream groups that aren't necessarily down our road and they come to their own conclusions so easily and people come up saying i just had no idea this was going on uh, and all i've done is just given them a little glimpse a window into another world and that's all we need to do and they'll do the rest so you know that's what i try to do in my work really is give people the key principles of why people are out there questioning what we are being presented with in the mainstream and there's a whole other world out there and when people recognize that you know they're often then drawn out of that matrix and you know they'll come to truth within themselves and that's the key thing 
you don't force it on them. You, you offer it and they will find it. I find most of the time. Well, you do that so eloquently, I might add, that you know, you're able to amalgamate conspiracy and spirituality and fact into this beautiful uh, presentation where you, I've always, as I said in the beginning, you let people reach their own conclusions, for example, the way you approach the crop circle phenomenon. And you know, I, I would just like to speak to also the fact that these so many people are awakening right now, I mean, in droves. And we, I don't want, I hate to call myself an old timer, but yeah, I will. We old timers have been at this for how many years? I mean, I've been in this life of spiracy, uh, spirit, conspiracy, the exposure, truth seeking most of my life. But certainly in the last 30 years, you know, I went into, I went into my first crop circle in 1997, which was the infamous Julia set. And it was like, hello, wakey, wakey. So, but a lot of people are waking up now and they're waking up to this four dimensional almost reality where it's just like, you know, back in the day, it was hard enough to find a tarot deck. And now it's just, you know, how much information do you want on any subject in any dimension? Here we go. And I think that this is very shocking for a lot of people because um, the waking up, what I call the wake up call, is not just waking up into the field of possibilities as you described where you give them a little information, they can run with it. It's just like blast. It's, it's just so much information. People just don't know what to do. It's frightening. It's overwhelming. And um, we need more people like you, like me, hopefully, who are trying to help people understand that above all, what we're talking now is merging spirit and science and being grounded enough in both to be able to find the objectivity and the neutrality to examine both sides, uh, and to bring a formation of how you perceive yourself in the world and not just the world happening at you. Well, I think what people are looking for overall at the moment is context, because as you say, everything feels so overwhelming. But if you can give them a framework in which to then make sense of some of these things going on, uh, it, it begins to sort itself out. I do find it really interesting, for instance, that even in these kind of very dark times, there is a draw back to the spirit not organized religion as such, but they keep saying, you know, spirituality seems to be on the rise. And also an interest in astrology as well. Now, you know, this is a big threat to the world of scientism because they hate astrology. Um, yet I look at it, and by the way, I mean, I'm married to a well-known astrologer called Helen Sewell. So, okay, uh, I get this firsthand. But I look at astrology and I can just observe that it works. You know, we can argue about why it works, how it works, but it does work. And yet, of course, you know, we have the world of astronomy, which hates astrology, always trying to denigrate astrology and and, you know, they, they always try to sort of throw a new spanner in the works. Recently, they've been trying to say, well, there's another zodiacal sign that nobody talks about. In other words, well, that makes a nonsense of it, doesn't it? But they're missing the point. That's not how astrology works. It's about psychological models as much as anything else. And they work in various frameworks. You know, it's a holographic universe. You know, they're looking at it from this Newtonian fixed physics way. And of course, they can't understand it. But the fact that people have been drawn to astrology astrology for all the debunking from the scientific world tells you people need something more that gives shape astrology gives a sense of context uh, maybe a hope that what they're going through at the moment might change because the heavens are changing if we are related in some way to that we will change we're not going to be stuck in the same place forever so i do find that really interesting that there's a new kind of draw back to things like that so it may well be that the darker the world gets actually the more people might open back to these ideas that you know certainly you know they burst big in the 60s and they've come and they've gone but it feels like we're going to go back to it but it'll probably be in a slightly new way in ways that we can't even comprehend but it's still that need for something wider to acknowledge that we're part of a bigger system and i find that very hopeful I do too. Well, remember that every age, I mean, we, we don't have that much written history, but we can, we can at least look back to the dark ages that were then followed by the Renaissance and know that the natural, or let's say the order of things appear to be the cycles of up and down, valleys and peaks, dark and light, etc. So we're, we're coming out of a pretty dark period here. And I love what you said, and I validate that that can feel and 
we too are two positive thinkers um, that we're now moving toward what we believe is the age of Aquarius, which we've been slowly entering. And uh, here's the dawn, we're getting there. And it, you know, it's like one last big hurdle here and a big pile of control, dark age, witch hunts. I mean, if you look at it, it's almost uh, identical, really. Right. I mean, one, I mean, you mentioned the Aquarian age. I mean, it's quite interesting. So now there are some debates about when it begins. Like Rudolf Steiner scholars believe it's a little bit later. But okay, many people believe we're kind of entering it now. So an average astrological age is roughly two thousand years ish. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if you go back to the last, uh, the beginning of the last age, which we're now just at the end of the age of Pisces, what do you have? You have the Roman Empire. You have fixed religious systems that were all about the old gods then, you know, the Olympian gods. And you would have looked at that and thought that was never going to collapse. It couldn't possibly go. And you've got very rigid, very draconian authoritarian forces running the world. And yet suddenly what happens? within a few hundred years, which is nothing in human time, it all falls away and Christianity arises, then Islam, and suddenly all these things, you never thought all the old gods could vanish, they're gone. Nobody cares about them anymore. And I think we're <laughs> at the same stage now. So at the moment, it all seems fixed. The people at the top, they think they're there forever. They're so arrogant, the hubris, they think nothing will ever shake their money and power. I think things are going to happen, they're going to change that. And also the Aquarian age is going to be very much more about collectivism and equality. And yeah. that's at odds with the old way of thinking. And I think that's going to shake a lot of systems up. And in a way, I mean, we're seeing that in a way now with things like Black Lives Matters, Extinction Rebellion. We've got all these movements that are either environmental or it's about we think every Everybody should be now, you know, caring more and be more equal. There should be more tolerance. And I know that, you know, some people worry that these are all manipulated plots in their own right. But I do think it's probably the beginning of a movement that's going to go that way anyway. The and fact that they can... years time, you know, we're, we're going to look back at these times and realize this is the crossover where the old forces are fighting desperately to stay there, but they're not going to win in the end. And we'll be into something new that will take care of itself in due course. I agree. I think that what you said about they're fighting amongst these, each other is very true. And there's a feeling I, per, I perceive personally that it seems like they're just falling back and they just keep trying to get their forward momentum again and, and something's happening where they just keep the powers that be I'm talking about just keep slipping back this didn't work this didn't work this didn't work and so they like you said they pull out more draconian god knows what's next I do think we're going to get a false invasion to bring it on let's see what is it a few uh, uh, asteroids planet x whatever but nothing whatever, seems yes. to to really work because I believe in the power of the human spirit the strength of the human spirit and that, uh, okay, if it means us being up against the wall, because, you know, Andy, the truth is, when, we're pl when everything is wonderful and we're in that peace time where, you know, everybody's making a buck and, you know, playing with their new toys, we don't get a lot done as a civilization. It's when we're, we're backed up against the wall that the human spirit rises and we take back some semblance of yes. our power. I, I do think that's really true. And I mean, actually, that raises an interesting point. So we mentioned the, the conference that I'm part of, the Glastonbury Symposium. So 30 years ago, when that began, it was very much, there was an emphasis on a sort of a spirituality that was about being saved. Now, some people thought the crop circle makers would come down and save us all, or we would be ascended onto spaceships, or the ascended masters would come and do all the hard work for us. So you had that element. You also had this element of prophecy. And then the 2012 prophecies built up that there was going to be a big change. And some people were hoping for ascension. You know, we'd all go into the fifth dimension. And the funny thing is, now we're in the very kind of difficult times people were talking about back then. People are going, oh, I didn't know it's going to be like this. I don't want this. I just wanted instant <laughs> enlightenment. Exactly. And you think, what did, what did you expect? So what you said there is right. When you've got your backs against the wall, actually, that's normally when the human race grows and you have to decide who you are and what you are and what you're now going to stand against that's no longer relevant. And that's where we are. So I don't think we're going to be saved by an outside force. That's not to say they're not there and they might be working with us, but we've got to do the work. 
Otherwise, it's a spiritual free lunch where you're offered enlightenment on a plate and you haven't learned anything. How can you learn anything from that? If we don't do the work, then we're not going to have that wisdom that comes with us. That's where we are now. So I know that what's going on at the moment, it seems very frightening. It's all very difficult. And I understand that. But, you know, we have to realize that this maybe is how we learn. And the way we approach these problems is the big thing. And we know that fear is being used to control us. So just step back from it. Don't overreact too much to things. And, and here's the big one, keep a sense of humor and keep a sense of lightness because that's what the dark forces don't understand they don't get it and the more you can just keep that and yeah you do everything you've got to do to combat all the rubbish that's going on but you keep on top of it and don't let it suck you in they can't win because they rely on us getting sucked into depression and then we take drugs and then we're more controllable and you know and they sell them (laughs) and and you can surf over the top of it it's so much easier yeah humor is so important that is one of my vehicles and you know i'm sure that occasionally somebody says well that's not very spiritual if you're making a joke about it but um, my approach is that there's nothing more spiritual than laughter nothing yeah, I agree. Uh, I nothing. Agree. That is really yeah, how no, you you're very good at doing that. You're very good at doing that. And that's so important because otherwise we'd be here having a very deep, gloomy conversation. And <laughs> there are things to be worried about. We get that. Yes. But that's not how you're going to deal with it. We'll get out of this by, by, you know, escaping from the clutches of that because that's an energy that drags you down. I wanted to talk about what you were talking about, about everybody ascending to the fifth dimension, which is all vogue at the moment. And I've been screaming and barking about it because according to the Syrian High Council, which is the information I channel, uh, it's always been about the fourth dimension. It's like, how do you think you're going to get from the density of your lives as individuals and as a civilization and the problems and the, uh, the imbalances of an unresolved civilization and sprout wings and suddenly you're in the fifth dimension. Sorry, there's this, why are you skipping over the fourth? Oh, we get it because this is where you deal with your crap. This is where you deal with your karma. And according, I don't know how much you're into uh, channeled information or not, so we we don't have to debate that. But according to that information, um, this is where we confront our karma individually and as a civilization, as a global civilization. So in this four dimensional context or density, which I really can feel we're in, we are now being confronted with globally, all the history, all of it, of this planet, all the wars, all the goodness too. And it's part of the extreme polarity. We're seeing you know, all the wars from the time of Atlantis and all of that collective energy playing out in front of us every minute, every hour, every day. And um, I feel very confident to say that uh, there are things going on that maybe we could discuss time slips. I'm having a lot of time slips where, where I'm finding myself in, in a situation and then back to uh, the, the reality that I was in before I left. And it's not astral uh-huh. projecting. It's like, zoop, 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 zoop. and I feel okay. this is part of this dimension. I feel like we're moving in out of this 3D structure and we're starting to feel this swirling. You know, we think of dimensions as something we climb up to reach a level of instead of it's within us, it's all around us. And it's about refining your perception to be able to pick it up and to hold uh, resonance there. But anyway, that's what I feel like. How possibly can we believe? And, you know, I I, I really want people to think about that. And that's not poo-pooing people who are sharing information about the fifth dimension but and the teachers that are trying to help people understand it. But that give a thought for a moment of, you know, how do you get from disharmony, rage, destruction, anger, abuse of the ecology, et cetera, to get it a hit the higher, higher. And let's, you know, acknowledge that there's passage that we have to go through to refine ourselves to reach those yeah, higher frequencies. That's, that's really important because I think, uh, yes. And I mean, ditto, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm saying we have to do the work, but that's not ruling out the interaction we have. I do believe in other levels of consciousness that I think can help us. But I suppose the thing is, it, it's to say, 
that what we do now matters. We are here now, because I know some people that, you know, less so now, but certainly when this all came around about 25 years ago, who were just waiting to be zapped up to the fifth dimension. Yeah. And that's all lovely, but it's, it's almost as if what happens here doesn't matter. Right. Look, we're here. If we're here, what happens matters. And our responsibility to the realm around us matters. And I think we see this in some uh, very religious end time movements that actually they don't care about the environment because they believe the last judgment's coming, apocalypse is coming anyway. They don't need to do anything. And I really just cannot resonate with that. You yeah. know, we're in this world, we've incarnated here. This is our responsibility. And it's a stage that's so important, as you say. You know, the fifth I mentioned may be lovely I look forward to it but we're here what's wrong with this there's terrible things but there's wonderful things about it too yeah. so let's appreciate where we are now and do the work we need to do now and, and we'll know when it's time to be on some other realm you know here we are faced with issues and we have a responsibility duty to this planet uh, and all the beings on it not just us um, to see that through so you know I think it's important to remember that Yes, it is. And it's important to, to contemplate the fact that at the soul level, this was a choice, as you say. We came here to, to, do, to live this. I believe that we, at the soul level, choose uh, what time we're going to come in and to whom the parents so that we have lessons to be learned. And that, you know, if you can't create heaven on earth, are you sure you're going to be able to create it on the fifth dimension? That's right. right. Well, the, the old spiritual, um, sort of controversial spiritual teacher, Stuart Wilde, who some of you may remember, he, he's passed away now. But I do remember him saying, if you're as thick as two planks in this dimension, you'll be as thick as two planks in the next dimension. <laughs> Meaning that if you, if you, you know, if you're dumb and not learning now, what makes you think you're suddenly going to be enlightened in the next one? What you do here matters. Yes. And that will determine what you are as you transfer to the next realm. So, you know, there's wisdom in that, I think. That is a lot of wisdom. And I'm certainly working to help people understand and re recognize the beauty of creation here, recognize the beauty and the geometry. And we, you know, of course, back to the crop circle certainly triggered our understanding of Fibonacci sequence and all of these ratios in geometry. What a fabulous way to communicate intelligence. I always tell people this. As far as crop circles go, just remember one thing. If you were a civilization far, far, far away, and you had the ability or desire to communicate with another planetary race or species, what would be the best way to communicate intelligence? And the answer always is not nano, 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 but ratio, geometry, number, the awareness of sequence, the understanding of proportions. And um, I'm getting off track of why I brought that up. But, but, but these are the inherent patterns of creation, of yeah, reality. Oh, yes, so we're talking you know, about any, the... Anything that can embody that in such an exquisite way as the crop circles, it, it's taking us back to the core principles of everything. Mathematics is beautiful. It's how things work. And it's not just a Newtonian thing that we've all been told about. It's something that's incredible, the way that it works. These are the patterns which are both visible and invisible. And I think they bind everything together. And somehow the crop circles albeit in a sort of a two-dimensional form that they invoke that and the, you know they take us I think beyond that because some people have tried to make diagrams of a crop circle as it would look in 3D but maybe there's 4D maybe there is 5D you know you can take this out with yeah. they're, they're like the first lesson it's like the first principles and maybe at some point we'll, we'll make more sense of it and go deeper. You know I was in a grocery store in Rome I'll never forget it and I was looking at the Italian broccoli, do you know the one that, that have the... Uh, well, like the, with the, the, the spiral, the sort of fractal spiral. The fractal like. spirals. Yeah. And I was... <laughs> the Italians have a very sardonic humor. At least the Romans do, like, check her out kind of energy. So I'm sitting in the grocery store and I'm looking at this fractal perfection. And then I knew that in... I mean, it was just extraordinary. If anybody doesn't know what I'm talking about, we're talking about those, they're called Romanesco uh, broccolis with all these fractals in, inside them. And it's like, if anybody were to ask me, what is creator? What is creation? And yes, we do have the crop circles that depict some of that, but pick up a Romanesque uh, broccoli and look at those fractals, the perfection of ratio. And then know that it's in every single aspect of nature everywhere, just as it's in us 
at the cellular level, at the subatomic level. It's all formulaic, perfected ratio mathematics and that kind of dynamic, something beyond our perception had to have the formula. That's my perception of yeah. creation. And um, if so you can't celebrate, broccoli, it, <laughs> but to, to be here and not celebrate that, to not seek it out, to not look at these beautiful things like flowers and trees and, and to, to seek out that wisdom and beauty is missing an extraordinary opportunity to develop yourselves on uh, uh to in preparation for whatever comes next right for sure yeah no i, I do agree yes here be here now as they say be here now Fully here present. we are let's let's make the most of where we are and we'll get to where we get to but what we do now does matter and the way we handle it so Thanks so much tell us a little bit more about your new book and um what are the highlights? What are you trying to, what is your most important message that you're trying to bring through in that material? So, I mean, the Truth Agenda book, that was very much about, yes, it involved conspiracies. It was also about consciousness research, how everything mixed together with the paranormal. But the Conspiracies book it is very much focusing on, as you might imagine, that more sort of harder conspiracy edge, but not trying to do it in a way to frighten, to try to make sense of it, to make it more approachable as a subject. So we understand why people do doubt what they're told in the mainstream and often they're right to, as we've already established. So the original version came out incredibly seven years ago and of course an awful lot's happened since then so all the classic areas that you would fully imagine to be in a book about uh, conspiracies are in there from jfk to 9 11 to princess diana everything you would imagine but in the last few years what's really kicked in is censorship and we've already touched on this today um, censorship of the uh, online world especially is now rife even before the pandemic came in uh, and and it sense, it, it, I sense a great fear coming from the powers that be there, the fact that they feel that they have to do this. And I really wanted to reflect that in the new version of the book and show where this censorship is occurring and how. And we've had, of course, people like Edward Snowden come forward and reveal yeah. that we're all under mass surveillance. Now, maybe we assume that, but many people didn't realize that. And that was important. And of course, lots of things have happened in the last seven years or so. And the big one, which absolutely needed to be uh, looked at, w was Donald Trump, who you mentioned earlier on. And, and now, look, I'm, I'm very aware that, you know, many people who are interested in conspiracies like Donald Trump. And of course, Donald Trump's now very much associated with the conspiracy world because of, as you've mentioned already, the QAnon movement. So there's material about that. Again, not trying to even judge it, but to say, look, these are the issues. Here are why people are talking about these things. And there are threads, there are patterns here. And I mean, now we get a different view of Donald Trump in England. The English media are absolutely against him. You know, all the media is against him. All the media is against him, but certainly here. I mean, I don't want to speak for the whole world, but certainly here. But now, interestingly, and I'm not trying to defend Trump here, but so I was in uh, the States with my wife uh, the, the year that Trump got elected. And we were there about three or four months be before the, the election campaigns really got going. And we were just talking to people and asking them, you know, do you think Donald Trump really stands a chance? And what really came over to us that we didn't pick up from the British media was that people felt he was more likely to speak for them everyday working class folk and they didn't feel that that had been the case with Obama they didn't feel that Hillary Clinton would do that now I just thought that was an interesting insight because people are very quick to condemn Trump and his followers but I think there was a hope that he would speak more for the everyday person he would be anti-establishment now, in some ways, he has been. Definitely. In some ways, he has been. And I don't think we can take that away from him. Um, whether when you've been in power for now nearly four years or whatever, you can truly be anti-establishment, I don't know. But certainly, he's been a disruptive force to the powers that be. 
And even if you don't like the decisions he's made, and some of them are highly questionable, I don't think we need to <laughs> argue that. But not all. Some some people think they're marvellous. But what we can say is he, he is unpredictable. And I think that the people at the tops of the usual elites don't know how to handle him. Definitely. And they don't know because you never know what he's going to tweet out next. <laughs> There's no control over it. Now, we've never known this before in a world leader. Now, that's dangerous on one level. Of course it Very. is. It's bypassing all the usual filters. It's very dangerous. But at the same time, it's quite nice in a strange way to, for once, to know that the normal filters are not controlling what he's saying. As far as we can see, whatever he wakes up with in his head that morning, out he goes and no one can stop it. And at least the way I see it is this, you know what you're dealing with. Right, any madness when well, it's there in front of you, you don't have to wonder what he's really thinking because he's just <laughs> so blindingly obvious about it. Well, as far as we can see, whereas you know, I know some people did like Hillary Clinton, but oh god, I would have always felt it would have been very shadowy. I would never have known where I stood with her. Were you really seeing the real thing? You know, we don't want to go too far down that road. But so, okay, there are big issues around Trump, but I also recognize that there's something there. But of course, he's got drawn into the conspiracy angle because the QAnon movement, and for anybody that doesn't know, should you not know, you know, this is allegedly a deep state mole or a collection of deep state moles in America who are releasing information which says that the New World Order is about to basically take over the world. But Trump is standing against them. And so the New World Order is trying to undermine Trump. So essentially, the QAnon movement, it, it, it's pro-Trump. And that's where the discomfort comes in for some. And of course, it's also associated with more right-wing thinking. And the mainstream media always says, uh, certainly here, anybody that believes in a conspiracy is right-wing or far-right. Which, okay, yeah, there is a tendency for right-wing thinkers to be more prone to that. And that's true. But it doesn't therefore mean that if you believe in a conspiracy that you are far right. But that's the equation that they want to make because then they can, you know, again, take you off the internet as a, as a nasty influence. So it's all far more complex than that. And in the book, in the conspiracies book, I've tried to get to the nub of this, to get away from the usual polarization, which is what we're always encouraged to fall into, and really look at the issues around Trump. And of course, in terms in terms of conspiracy, he's an interesting figure. He was one of the first people to go uh, public and say he thought bombs had brought down the Twin Towers. Now, you can, you can find it on YouTube, I think, unless I've taken it down yeah. of him. This is only a few days. So obviously a lot of people had hoped if he got into power, he might commission a new investigation. Now he didn't. And there have been some disappointments. And indeed, he's uh, appointed to power some people who were, you know, in the eyes of some, actually all part of the original 9-11 conspiracy. We won't rake through that today. But, you know, many do not believe the official story is true. So you've got that strange angle. You know, he's also, he's questioned vaccination, though he's pulled back from that now. And you get the feeling somebody really said, Mr. President, you can't go down this road. Um, but nonetheless, you can see he's used to questioning the norm. And so a lot of people had hopes that he would be the voice now for conspiracy thinking. And he sort of is and he sort of isn't. It's kind of gone a strange way. But then, of course, you've got the big conspiracy theory that all mainstream media believe, which is that he worked with the Russians. Well, and that's the, so... You know, but what I thought was that's, interesting... That's where, where do you believe? Yeah, it doesn't matter whether you believe it or not. But what I thought was really interesting was that the mainstream media that says it doesn't believe in conspiracy theories, they all believe that conspiracy theory. And, and so that suddenly you realize they do believe in conspiracy theories when it suits their agenda. When it suits their so, agenda. So, exactly. so all of that's being discussed in the book. And the, there's a lot of stuff around that, as well as, you know, all the other things you might imagine we would need to discuss. I think that um, one of the things that people should consider is the fact that everybody that we understand to be the cabal, all these big power brokers, and I won't name the names because we do want to stay on the air, uh, hate his guts. So that was the first thing that I was paying attention to. It's like if they, all the people that I look at with psychic eyes, with intelligence, with discernment, uh, I think are on the dark side and they all hate his guts, then, you know, let me pay attention to this guy for a minute. 
And yes, he's a blunt force object. And that is very refreshing. And he says things, I feel the same way as you. There are moments when I, I'm just like, you didn't just say that, did you? And I ask myself, is it stupidity or is it intended manipulation? In other words, is he saying something to evoke a reaction? Or is it just because he's a blunt force object and he's always gotten away with saying what the hell he wants because he's a rich power broker? But one thing seems to be very clear to me. He is either a great actor, which I, I, don't, I don't think this choice is the one, or he really does believe that he's fighting the Cabo. And so whether or not Anon is saying it, Trump keeps dropping these clues. And uh, he, he, I feel he's trying to let us know. I think he might just be an evangelist and seeing himself in the Armageddon position of leading the war against the darkness. I'm not sure about that. But one thing I, I truly pick up from him is that I think he believes what he says and what he's doing. I think that's probably true. I suppose the difficulty there, though, is that what he believes one day is not necessarily what he believes the next day. <laughs> so awesome. yes, you've got you've got conviction, but there's a there's a discontinuity which could be troubling there. But yeah, I mean the QAnon movement. I mean they. I mean here's the only difficulty. Well, one of the difficulties is that if it's true, and the QAnon people are actually coming up with real information, some of the predictions they've made haven't happened. Back this May, for instance, it was widely said that, you know, all the world's communications would go down for a few days. And during that, these days of darkness, uh, that, you know, all the naughty people in the world would be rounded up and uh, arrested and then the world would be good and happy. Well, that hasn't happened. And there's a number of other things that haven't yet happened. So, you know, the worry some people have is what if this whole thing is just somebody leading us all astray? And if it were to be revealed that QAnon actually was just either either a hoax or a big joke. Of course, a lot of people that have gone along with this, it's adherence, they're going to look very silly and all conspiracy theorists will be tainted by that and all beliefs in conspiracy would be brought down at the same time. So there is one worry from some that the whole thing actually is a deliberate attempt to build this up and then crumble it down so that they discredit any conspiracy thinking we, we can only hope that's not true but so i'm a bit wary it's hard to know the absolute truth of it uh, and i'm just suspending judgment on it but it's there and it's something that many people feel passionately about uh, and it's not going to go away for the time being and you know if you see somebody holding up a big letter q at a rally or a demonstration then that's what it's about it's showing uh, you know support for the q anon movement and it must be getting big now because uh, i think just last week TikTok which is this kind of video platform that young people use a lot, has had to take down thousands of, of pro QAnon videos. So, you know, it's now really getting out there. Uh, um, so if this is a big hoax, it's working well, because then everyone knows about it, then they can crumble it away. Or if it is real, well, then, yeah, it's it's getting word out there. But we shall see. We shall see. But we do have Trump definitively going out some of the the uh, premises of q are underway we do see the swamp clearing i mean we're not seeing massive arrests but we do see more and more um of the child trafficking scenario coming to light and um i think that that goal that trump set openly at the beginning is being honored he is it does seem, let's say it does seem that this is bubbling up to the surface. And of course it's so monumental and so global and so almost unthinkable that any, anyone could even dare attempt to get to this. But you know, that seems to be underway. And as far as all the evil doers coming to light, there do seem to be some people in places like Hollywood that are, apparently in difficulty their shows are being canceled they look like they're under a house arrest again you're so right it could be a big hoax but uh i don't think so we will see how this plays out we're certainly going to know a lot more at the election after the election happens what do you think will be the outcome i don't think you're the type to make a prediction but just out of curiosity let's see what what we can get from you there 
Well, I mean, only as an observation, as an English person, so I'm not directly connected to this, of course. Um, I certainly, I know that the media, again, is building it up to Trump's going to lose, he's finished. I, I don't think it's going to be that clear cut. And I think that a lot of people that because of the mainstream media sort of bias against him, they don't want to stand up and be counted when it comes to the vote, they may suddenly go back for Trump. So you've got this aspect to it. Um, I'm not sure that Joe Biden is a strong enough candidate. Uh, I think a lot of people worry that he's a little bit too old world, that he's just not radical enough, he's not new enough. So whether that's an issue, I don't know. But of course, then you've got the whole faction that believe that you can vote for who you want, the whole thing's rigged anyway. And there's a lot of concern about that, especially when electronic voting is being used. And they want to bring that in here, too. And many people think you're just inviting fraud, electoral fraud. Well, the so truth who is knows? That, who knows? The truth is the whole voting thing is so rigged anyway. I mean, people really believe that they have that this is an example of liberty. But when you look at how it's all set up between the art of the false voting, the media and the campaigning, and all the way it's manipulated, you know, whatever. So, I mean, given that, you know, it may well be that the powers that be win-win, you know, whichever way it goes, if they're going to manipulate it, they'll get what they want. But again, never think that they can't make mistakes. You know, they could one day expose themselves accidentally as the, you know, wicked people that many people believe they are. And we'll see it and everybody will see that. So let's see. You know, but uh, no, so I can't make a prediction. I don't think it's a given that Trump will lose, uh, but you Definitely can assume not. that the powers that be will be thinking who's most useful to us now. Uh, but obviously, look, we're at a difficult time in history. The, the situation with China is very volatile, and that's very worrying. Um, you know, some researchers, people like David Icke, has been saying for years that a war with China is what the New World Order wants. So, well, let's hope not. Uh, but yeah, it, it's it's not an easy time coming up, I think. And I think actually, I mean, astrologically, if you look at the next few months to the end of this year, it, it's certainly going to be volatile. The world is not going to be calming just yet. And I think we're going to see a lot more before the end of this year. So. What does Helen see? Is, obviously, you're privy to a, a really powerful mm. astrologer. Does she have some insights you want to share? She does. I mean, you would have to talk to Helen, which I would advise to get more on that. But, but in essence, yeah, I think that particularly uh, in, next month and then October, there's some rocky times coming up. I can't give you the detail. Although the good news is the winter solstice seems to suggest a kind of a moving into slightly a new era. So let's hope so. Uh, but um, yeah, I mean, you know, she certainly has got a lot of insights. Uh, if anybody wants to have a look, by the way, look her up. Astrologicalinsights.co.uk. She's a well-known. Yeah, well, when we, uh, when we finish, please send me uh, some of this information. I'll put it up under the video so people can refer. You. And, you know, have her ask her if she'd like to do a show with me. I'd love to pick her brain sure. and share with her. I can't right, so, ask. Are you okay. Um, we're kind of winding down now. I mean, can't believe it. We've been together so long. But... Um, is there anything you really want to leave the audience with besides your extraordinary, hopeful sense of where we're going? Not besides it, but definitely any yeah. particular piece of information that you think is vital now before we sign out. I think the thing right now is to not get overwhelmed by, you know, all the confusion of which there is much uh, and all the darkness. And I think that the, the way out of it is to be informed. Uh, and that's what I'm trying to do is just spread information where people can at least be informed, even if you can't work out exactly what's going on. I think you feel better when you know, OK, there's this element to it here. There's that there. You see the shape of it. You have a, a sense of a framework of what's happening. Uh, I think that's useful. So do, do don't just have an opinion based on nothing or just on the last thing you heard on social media. It might not be right. And we're all trained these days to react everything every news headline every social media post including from the truth of the world it, it seems to want you to react and so we act out and i always think a better way to do this and i try to follow this practice now is when i read a sensational piece of information before i react or judge it, i go okay i'm just going to sit with that just going to see how that feels and give it a few hours even a few days and mull it a little bit don't just 
bang straight down with your opinion in response. You know, maybe you might find some new information coming through soon that, that might balance that out. So I think, you know, remember this. I think we are manipulated by being sort of uh, told to overreact. So I think don't react in quite that way because then we won't fall into polarization. Bear in mind, polarization has been encouraged. It's classic divide and rule, whether it's Democrat versus Republican, Leave versus Remain, REU debate here, black versus white, all of these, it's almost like polarization is continually cranked up. Just step back from that. Don't fall into those camps. You know, try as much as possible to, you know, keep a, an eye and an ear open to both sides and understand what the debate is uh, and, you know, get the detail of that. And in terms of the pandemic, yeah, if you're really curious to know more about, you know, what the issues really are in an unbiased way, I mean, do look at my website uh, and just you'll find it. It's in the main articles there. My article about the pandemic uh, is up there. And, and it's just helpful just to see what the elements that are being argued over are. And then, you know, you'll at least get a better idea. And there's other articles by other people out there which do that same thing, you know. Uh, so have a look, truthagenda.org, and you can find out all about my work there and lots of videos to watch me giving talks, all kinds of articles. So have a look. But, you know, there's other people out there doing great work and, and I include you in this Patricia just mm -hmm. trying to get conversations going and in an age where clearly people are trying to shut down these conversations it becomes ever more important to keep them going so spread the information spread the links you know keep talking to people even if they make fun of you even if you think that they're not going to listen just keep going not in a way that forces it on anybody but offer your truth and show them that there are wider debates out there to be had and then i think you're doing real service to the human race and everything else on this planet because as i think we've established today we're all interconnected at the end of the day profound and i want to just add to that and then we'll close up Remember that those lower chakras are, when Andy was talking about being triggered in polarity, that, you know, survival, you know, sexuality, power, that, that drumming, that stirring up of that lower, which we, we love all lower chakras too, but not when they're being stimulated and abused. So just remember that when you are confronted with people who are in that fear and hatred and, and whatever, just keep bringing it up to the heart and just tell, keep reminding them, look, I'm speaking to you from the heart. I'm speaking to you from the heart. At least try to hear me. Don't shut me down. At least try to hear me. And, you know, if you get a bunch of profanity, just click the button that says, you know, goodbye and stop beating yourself up trying to persuade or win over people who are, are completely closed because you're just wasting your energy on it. And maybe someday they'll come back and maybe they'll be able to have a conversation. In the meantime, this has been an extraordinary conversation. You never let me down, Andy. You're the man. Thank you so much. It's been a real Andy. pleasure. Thank you. We'll have to do more of this, okay? So you guys, you now know Andy Thomas. If you haven't already met him, because a lot of you are in America and overseas in other locations, one of our leading researchers, one of our most important voices for alternative truth, and truth is what we're trying to get to here. So thanks a million. We will post all of the links for Andy and uh, hopefully have him back soon on Beyond the Matrix. Thanks, Andy. Take care. I Thank hope you. I see you soon. I hope so. Bye, everybody.